Um, I got two pages of introductions here, but it should go pretty quick. The Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Romans. Um, start off with, I'll give you the statistics, 16 chapters, 433 verses. And then we came to the words, and I'm like, good grief. I got three different numbers, and they're all from Dr. Ruckman. <laughs> uh, in his book, on his commentary on Romans, and by the way, let me tell you, let me, let me just say up front, probably about 85%, sometimes it's even higher than that, of the material you're going to get, I got from Dr. Ruckman. I might throw in maybe 10% of something God gives me, but... And you say, well, you know, there's some, some brethren that might be critical of that, you know, and go get your own fresh bread or whatever. But um, Dr. Ruckman is a great source of material. And he sometimes, he's the one that sets me on a path to, to add to something or think something else through. It's all because of the basic building blocks I got from Dr. Estep and Dr. Ruckman. And uh, plus, I bought that commentary, paid good money for it. Of course I'm going to use it. I don't know why you buy a commentary or not, right? Especially a guy that's a Bible believer. But anyway, I digress. In his commentary, he gives two numbers, 9,477 words and 9,447 words. And then in, in his study Bible, he's got 9,422 words. Okay, now, I figured it out what, what the problem was. Okay, first of all, the 9,477 is a misprint. That's a misprint because he's got two numbers in, the same, I mean, in, in his, uh, in his uh, commentary. So that's a misprint. And he said, well, how can you have a difference of 25 words? I'm going to tell you how you can have a difference of 25 words. Look at the title and count how many words are in the title. How many you got? I counted nine. Okay, now go to the end of the book. And count that last little paragraph where it says, written to the Romans from Corinthus and sent by Phoebe, servant of the church of Chincrea. And you get 16. 16 and 9 is 25. And that's the difference between 9,447 and 9,422. So it depends on the program and what it's told to count. Yeah. And that's usually the difference. If you get a discrepancy, start counting either. The, sometimes it's just the title. So, okay, we, since we settled that. All right, the date of the writing is around 58 A.D., okay? Around 58, and that's only, that's only 10 years before Paul's executed. He's executed in 68. It's interesting that before 70 A.D., before that happens, Paul's already gone. He's already in glory. But the, the date of the writing is somewhere around 58. Uh, it's almost impossible to, to uh, uh, iron down an absolute date for the writing of a lot of these epistles. But you do have some indications. There's a good chance, well, there is, there is absolutely, before, let's say, Acts chapter 25. Because Paul's talking about going to Rome in the book of Romans. Okay? He's talking about the time when he might be able to come and see them. He has not gone yet. Well, in Acts 25, that's when he appeals unto Caesar and is going to go, he's going to be transported to Rome. Okay? So you know it's before that that he wrote uh, this uh, epistle to the Romans. Uh, the theme of Romans is justification by faith. There's, we're going to find out there's a, there's, there's a great reason why it's the first book. Everything has purpose in the, in the Bible. Everything. And we're going to see that it is, well, it was astounding to me. It's stuff I didn't even realize until I started getting into this. But the theme of Romans is justification by faith. Key words, okay? Key words, believe it or not, is of God. It, those two together, of God found more times in Romans than in any other New Testament book, okay? Of God is found 74 times in the book of Romans. Um, Romans is a doctrinal book on salvation. 
which is probably one of the reasons why it's the first one in line. Now, it may not be the one that you would give to a, uh, a new born-again Christian. Of course, you've probably given them the Romans road out of the book of Romans. But you might ask them to, to read 1 Thessalonians first. And the reason 1 Thessalonians is a good book for a new believer is because in all five chapters, the second coming of Jesus Christ is emphasized in all five. Mentioned in all five chapters. And that is key for a Christian that's going to get off the ground doctrinally and sound that they believe that the second advent is, going, is an event that's going to happen. Then on top of that, in chapter 4, you have the rapture. Okay, uh, two, two events that the world just doesn't want to believe, and most religion doesn't even believe it. I mean, Catholicism doesn't believe Jesus Christ is coming back at all. Or after a thousand years, that's what the post-millennialist thinks. And the world thinks the rapture is a joke. Both of them are two events that will take place, and you want a Christian grounded in that from the very beginning. But you've got to get them saved first, right? Hence the book of Romans. Great book. Takes somebody for salvation. Romans teaches saved by grace through faith plus nothing. That's why it's such a great book. It teaches that. Galatians teaches kept by grace through faith plus nothing. And Martin Luther, those, those two books, I mean, when he got a hold of Romans, uh, the just shall live by faith, I mean, we're talking about kicking off the Reformation from two books in the Bible, and that's Romans and Galatians. Saved by grace, kept by grace. Saved by faith, kept by faith. Um, Paul writes to seven churches, just as John does. Paul writes to the, and I, I'm going to check and see. When, I wanted to look at that earlier and I forgot to. Uh, to all that be in Rome. That's interesting, man. i got to keep that in mind for a second. So he's writing to them of Rome. Um, and, it, it, you know, you say, well, he's addressing the Christians. Well, uh, he says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. So he's addressing the Christians there, but he's writing to Rome. And then you have Corinth. Then you have Galatia. Then you have Ephesus and Philippi, Colossae, or the Colossian church, and Thessalonica, the Thessalonian church. Okay, seven. John writes to seven churches in Revelation chapter three and, or 2 and 3. And the only one that matches, there's only one. And which one's that? Nope. Corinth. Nope. Nope. Ephesus. <laughs> you got it eventually. <laughs> Ephesus. And I, you know, we say why. I don't know why, but both of them, both of them address Ephesus. The one thing about Ephesus, though, is what did she do? Left her first love. Um, that's, what, that's basically what the church is guilty of in, uh, um, in Laodicea. Left her first love. So anyway, but you have both of them writing seven churches. And of course, Rome, the Roman church is the first one on the list to get a letter. Or the first one, I'm sorry, in the order. I don't know about who got what letter first. I might be able to sort some of that out. But there's a reason why God put the book of Romans, right after the book of Acts. Okay? There's a reason. Um, and it's very significant. Writing to Rome, and it says citizens, includes nearly all of Europe. I never thought about that. I'm thinking, you know, just this locality of Rome, uh, you know, a city uh, of Italy, and I'm thinking, you know. But no, we're, we're talking about the Roman Empire. He is addressing... The Roman citizens to all that be in Rome. So that includes the, the, an empire of the, of the known world. That's huge. And here Romans kicks it off. And I, I didn't, I didn't, I never, I never took that and understood that. I knew that Rome at the time was, it, uh, was the world power. And, the, at, you know, we're talking, they, they, 
uh, conquered on three continents. Not only that, but it would, the epistle would also apply or be aimed at America. Why? Well, most Americans are transplanted Europeans who once were a part of the Roman Empire. Our roots are in the Roman Empire. Um, most of Europe, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, or most of Europe is um, rooted in that. But here's the, here's the thing that is significant. Rome is the last world empire described in Daniel chapter 2 before the second advent. Now, let me think what I was going to say about that. Oh, uh, turn to Acts chapter 1. There's a reason why Romans is first. In Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, this is talking about the ascension of Christ. It says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, talking about the Lord, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which, said, uh, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. That is a very prophetical verse. Not only, does he come, not only does he come back visibly and bodily, but the same empire will be, will be back in power. In fact, what we can tell you is they, ne they never leave power. They change, but they don't leave power. And what you've got is you've got the Roman Empire, around 325, and Constantine comes along, and next thing you know, this thing's converting over to a religious power. It goes from a military might that is covering into three continents. All of a sudden, now it's 102 acres, but it's still dictating to kings, queens, uh, prime ministers, uh, you name it, presidents, still dictating to them what they're going to do. You see, Rome never left power. That's the reason why it's the last one, on, or not the last of the image, but it's the, it's the legs of the image. Actually, well, we'll get to that in just a second. Um, look in Daniel chapter 2. When we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar's image, that image is still prophetically accurate even today. It's still going on. We're still working our way through these kingdoms. You've got Nebuchadnezzar. He's the, he's the, he's the head of uh, Babylon. He's that head of gold. And then you have Media Persia. Okay? Then you have Greece. Well, then it talks about the legs. Well... When the image or the stone, I'm sorry, when the stone which is cut out, cut out of uh, the mountain without hands, it's referring to Christ, he's the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This stone comes down and crashes into that image. But he doesn't crash into the legs, he crashes into the toes, the feet of, of, of the image. And what's going on right now is Rome is those legs. Just as you have media Persia, do you know what you have? You have Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodox. You've got two branches of Rome right now. No longer a military might, they're a religious might. That's what John wondered with great amazement. He, he, he couldn't believe the transformation. Especially going from this kingdom that had stretched across all of Europe into Asia and Africa, and yet here they were on 102 acres. I mean, you know, people got farms bigger than, than, than uh, the Vatican, but yet they're still dictating to kings and queens. Presidents, prime ministers, still dictating. Daniel chapter 2, verse 33 and 34 says, His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. 
And thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, and they were uh, uh, that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Now, of course, at that point, the whole image falls, but it, it, it's that that stone does not come down until the feet, or excuse me, yeah, the feet with the toes that are in power. Ten toes, ten confederate nations banded together, and there's something about the angels are mixed in with that. We talk about iron mixed with clay. Um, the other thing that struck me is the legs. Okay, Media Persia probably had one of the longest reigns, the arms, but the legs, two millennia. Actually, Rome might even been more than that. I'd have to figure it up. Yeah, it's longer than two millennia. But we're, I mean, two legs, 2,000 years at least, where they've been in power. Now, you know, you, you may not notice that as much, but you just, don't, you, you just don't see the influence that they have on governments. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You know, the Pope's up there, you know, peace, peace, you know. When that devil is behind the scenes, is controlling what goes on in, in uh, the world arena, man, he is, he's got his hand on everything. They are, they are guilty. In Revelation 18, they're guilty of all the martyrs of Jesus. Uh, it's, it's, and it, it's, that's why she's called the whore right there. She's guilty of fornicating with the nations and making them drunk with the wine of her fornication and then pouring out her wrath on real Christians, of which you have in the Dark Ages, you have thousands upon thousands, into the millions, that are killed by Rome. Okay? But what I'm getting at here is, when you, get, when you finish the book of Acts, which is the Acts of the Apostles, Romans. Why? That's the one in power. That's the one in power, and that's the one we're, that's the one we're trying to win. That's the one, ones we're trying to uh, uh, convert. It, it, it pictures the whole shebang. I don't know if you realize it, but every church that Paul addresses is part of the Roman Empire. They're part of it. So that's why you have the book uh, of Romans first. Um. When you get to the end of the Gospels, of course, Rome is the culprit, okay, in the fact that they're guilty of crucifying Jesus Christ. And then they start murdering his disciples. I mean, in Acts 12, you got James being killed by the sword by Herod. Um, so it just makes sense. I mean, that's... At the second coming of Jesus Christ, Babylon the Great, and it's mystery Babylon. You know, you've got, um, you've got the kingdom of heaven in mystery form uh, spoken of in, um, I don't know how many different parables, but it, especially in Matthew chapter 13. You know that this Rome is like in a mystery form. She's not like she was. She's completely changed, but yet she's still doing the same thing. So... We're addressing Rome because Rome is still in power. Uh, the other thing is Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. Look at Romans chapter 15, verse 16. Yep. How about, I'm sorry? Is that what it is? Yep. That's a huge number. In Romans 15, 16, it says, uh, talking about Paul, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Paul's gospel is going to be... Paul is so special because he received special revelation, which we'll look at that verse. But his gospel is in force till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In other words, when you're reading through Romans, you're reading 
you're reading something that, I mean, it's like, where did this come from? What is this? I mean, there's a, there's a faith and work salvation in the Old Testament. There's a faith and work salvation in the tribulation. There's a faith, or there's a work salvation in the millennium. But by grace through faith, plus nothing, minus nothing. What is this? And this was special revelation that God gave Paul. And it's, a, and it's because of the rejection of the Jews of their Messiah that he turns to the Gentiles to call out a bride for his son. But man, nobody knew this. I mean, now we look back, we can see types in the Old Testament. But nobody knew this. He said he received it not of men, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he, tell, he tells Paul, look, you're going you're to go to the Gentiles, a minister of Jesus Christ. You know, it even talks about Paul being a continuation, um, a continuation of Christ's ministry. And some people might take offense to that and say, well, Paul, he's not Christ equal. Well, he's not saying he's his equal. But you know what Jesus Christ said in Matthew 15? He said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, after his rejection, they said, well, now it's time to send somebody to, to be the minister. And that's what it says. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And Paul fulfilled that. So, man, there's a, there's a change right there. We're, we are no longer... When you get to Romans, he's talking about the Gentiles of the world that we're to reach. It's no longer about Jews. The, you, at the end of the book of Acts, do you, do you know what it says? Look, look what it says at the very end of the book of Acts. Um, no, no, no wonder I can't find it. That won't, that won't help. As in the end of the Gospel of John. Let's see. Verse 28. This is after you find three rejections of the gospel of grace by the Jews. Not only do you have three rejections of, of, of the kingdom and the king, but you find three rejections of the gospel of the grace of God in the book of Acts. And it, huh? 28, 28. All right. He tells them, well, he said, verse 27, For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, that they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I, sh and I should heal them. And notice, he's... Um, um, I'm trying to see where he's talking to the Jews. Okay. It says, and they, verse 21, they said unto him, we neither receive letters out of Judea concerning... Oh, it's the Jews. They, okay, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, verse 19. But when the Jews spake against it... I'm sorry, what verse do you say, brother? 29. 29? Okay, okay, that's good enough. I, I was going to go all the way up to verse 16. Um, it said, when he had... Uh, verse 28 and 29, Be it known therefore to you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. That's how the, the book of Acts ends with that final rejection. Next book, Romans. Okay? It's not that we don't want to send a missionary to Israel. We do. It's not that we don't want to win Jews. We do. But I'm afraid we're just as on the hook for the rest of the world. In fact, we're to concentrate on the Gentiles as a whole. You know, anywhere we can send missionaries to try to win them. Um, let me see where I'm at here. I got ahead of myself. Uh, in Romans 16.25, Romans 16.25, he says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Remember I told you that Paul got special revelation? Here's something that nobody knew. And it was revealed to Paul. And God said, this is what I want you to do. When Paul says my gospel, he's just not talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's part of it. That's the message in it. But his gospel is those Pauline epistles. Okay? 
And those Pauline epistles are, is what is truth for all of us in this age. Now, it's not that there's not other stuff, but everything has to be uh, filtered through those Pauline epistles for this age. Why? It's a new revelation. It's a new revelation it was, that Paul is given that was kept hidden since the world began. That's why the Bible doesn't make sense to most people because they're not, they're not believing what they're reading. You can't imagine going through, going, I mean, the Jews make it back in the land, you know, they rebuild the city, they rebuild the temple. Jesus Christ shows up, they crucify him. Next thing you know, man, we're building churches everywhere. And everybody goes, what, what happened? <laughs> well, that's what God kept hid. Who knew that he was going to insert 2,000 years calling out a bride for his son among the Gentiles? They didn't know that. Look at Luke chapter 21, verse 24. So the significance that the first book you run into, right after the book of Acts, is the book of Romans. Luke 21, 24 says, uh, in, in reference to the Jews, and they shall fall by the, by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. That happened in 70 A.D. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, I'm here to tell you that what Paul wrote in those 13 epistles from Romans to Philemon is doctrine for this age. Now, it's not, and we'll look at it as foundation. In fact, I'll give you, uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Because the book of Romans is the foundation for all the church age. New Testament doctrine, because why? Because Paul is the pattern. Paul is the pattern. Uh, I didn't say you can't find church doctrine in other books of the Bible. I'm talking about the foundation. Here's the way this works. If you can find a verse that doesn't contradict what Paul says, take it. Take it. And you can find plenty of them. You can find How to Rear Children in the book of Proverbs, and it's probably not going to contradict anything Paul said because he didn't go into any depth about raising children. Take it. If you can find promises that Paul says, you know, hey, you know, he doesn't say you can't claim that promise, claim it. But you're going to have to judge everything by what Paul wrote because he's the pattern. Look at 1 Timothy 1.16. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy... That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them that should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. And what we find out, he's the pattern for doctrine, suffering, service, sacrifice. I mean, you know, the, this group that doesn't believe in any water baptism. Well, and I don't believe that water baptism is necessary to be saved. It's not even a part of getting saved. It's a picture of it. But Paul was baptized. And he's the pattern. So we still teach that when, it, when somebody gets saved, I mean, they get saved as Christ to be their Savior, they get baptized because it's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection. Whether it, was to, whether it was what Ananias thought about it is irrelevant. Paul's the pattern. And you can follow that pattern. He said, be followers of me as I also am of Christ. But he's the foundation. The Pauline epistles are the foundation for a doctrine. And what does it begin with? The book of Romans and salvation by grace through faith. And it's key. Get that wrong, you're a heretic. Get that wrong, you're a cult. It doesn't matter who you are. You can't get that wrong. So, our foundation is Paul. Not Peter, not James, not John, not Jude. Okay, we can get stuff from them. And our foundation has got to be the Apostle Paul. All right. One other thing that Dr. Ruckman brought up is that, um, of course, you know, if God tells you that Paul is your, your standard, you know what the world's going to tell you. It's somebody else. Who are they going to tell you the standard is? Peter. Who, who was in Rome? Peter was in Rome. Proof? None. They, turn, they twist one little verse, I believe, over there, and uh, I think it might be James. 
No, it might be Colossians. I can't remember where, where they changed the word Babylon to Rome. Huh? Is it Peter? Okay. Thank you. But if you follow what Scripture says, Peter was never in Rome. Now, I'm going to give you a few verses here. Look at Galatians 2.7. Now, eventually, when Paul's there, there is some Jews there that he speaks to. But, you know, um, the Jews get expelled probably after, shortly uh, after Paul's executed or right about that time, they start expelling the Jews from Rome. But I don't think there was a huge population of them. But look, it says Galatians 2.7. It says, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, that's Gentiles, was committed unto me, Paul, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. One of the good reasons why Peter was probably never in Rome is he's, a, he's a, an apostle to the circumcision. He's ministering to those in Judea and the rest of, and the rest of Israel. Look at Galatians 2.9, two verses later. And when James, Cephas, and John... Now, that's not the James, uh, the brother of John. That's going to be James, the Lord's brother. And when James, Cephas, that's Peter... And John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Well, why would you think that Peter went to Rome when he is an apostle to the circumcision? And then Paul says this, and this kind of clenches it. In Romans chapter 15, verse 20. Romans 15, 20, he says, Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. He even talks about the line, the line of work, and not crossing into someone else's line. Staying in your own line, what God gave you to do. You know? A lot of preachers like to get in everybody else's business. Mind your own. Mind your own business. What's going on in your church, not whatever's going on in everybody else's church. Um, anyway, more than likely, Peter was never, never even visited Rome. Was never there. Of course, the Catholic Church is going to swear by it. Why? I mean, their first pope was Peter. They got a problem if he never showed up, right? Of course, you know, wasn't Peter married? Hmm. Hmm. I, I, I was going to say something. I'm not going to say it. Anyway, um, Peter drops from view completely after Acts 15, verses 7 to 11. You know what he does? You know what he says in Acts 15, 7 to 11? Turn over there. He concedes that Paul's message is right. Acts 15, starting in verse 7. And when there had been much disputing, <laughs> Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, now Paul's in Jerusalem to prove that what he's teaching is, is, is the truth and, and from God, and that you don't have to do anything to get saved, and you have to do anything to stay saved. Because that's what the Pharisees were saying. Oh, you've got to be circumcised. Oh, you've got to do this. You've got to do that. He said, men and brethren, you know how uh, that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles, by my mouth, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He did open the door for the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. That was Peter. And God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us. The Holy Ghost fell on them, they spoke with tongues. That's how Peter knew. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye, tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers or nor we were able to bear? The law, that was the yoke. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Do you realize after this, Peter, I mean, unless you go read first and second, that's it. He's done. All the way through to the end of the book. The emphasis from that point is the Apostle Paul. Something changed. Um, 
in, let me move on. In this age, the church is the body of Christ. We're talking about a body of believers. And what's interesting is, and you've probably noticed this if you've read through your Bible, uh, read through the, uh, the Pauline epistles, or just even read through the New Testament, it's neither Roman nor Orthodox. That is, it doesn't really attach itself to any religion. It's neither American nor English nor any other country. It's neither Islamic or communist. There's no political backdrop to it. You ever notice that these Christians are just, they have, they have their worldview completely changes. Now I'm going to say something, and, and you know, I'm an American, okay? Live in America, appreciate the liberties in America, but my worldview is God's going to judge this nation and probably destroy it. Okay? And for several reasons. Number one, there's too many Jews here, and they need to go home. Well, I, I, I'm not saying that. The Bible says that. I'm not being anti-Semitic. I think we should help them get home. Okay? Instead of driving them home by trying to eliminate them. But I believe God's going to tear up this country and get that Jew to go back home. Because he says he's going to. And, but you'll notice that the disciples don't talk about their, I mean, Paul, only a couple times Paul invokes his Roman citizenship, and that's to keep from getting a beaten. <laughs> or to get back at somebody that's thrown him in jail unjustly. Okay, And I'm not saying I'm not going to, I probably pulled out my American passport a few times when I was over in Europe, you know. Um, one time I, I used my American citizenship to get to the front of a line. It, it was arrogant. It was uh, desperate. But I had to. I was going to run out of gas. And the Lord honored it. And, well, I actually didn't even have to pull my pair, but they just knew I was, I was an American or English or something, and they let me in. But um, it's a spiritual body of believers governed by Scripture. We are governed by Scripture. And we hold that Scripture to, be, to, to supersede anything else, including our Constitution. Now, if you don't believe that, I don't know where you're at with God, but you can't believe that book, the Word of God, and not realize it supersedes everything. Now, I, I'm saying that to you, but if you were over in Communist China, you'd have no problem believing that, would you? But when you're on a free country, do you realize that there are Christians in, in communist China? There are Christians in India and in Pakistan. There are Christians in Saudi Arabia. They're living under every possible political backdrop you can even imagine. And guess what? Same epistles. We're governed by scripture and separate from culture, politics, religion, even race. And the other thing is, no longer is the kingdom of heaven the physical kingdom in play. Okay? The difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom that Jesus Christ is going to bring to this earth. He offered to the Jews, they rejected it because they rejected him as king. But the kingdom of God, the Bible says, is within you. But look what it says about that in Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not something physical. That's why we, we don't think about buildings or uh, building some kingdom here on this earth. Because what we're fighting for, what we're, what we're ministering to do is to propagate the kingdom of God by getting people saved. He said the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now we have physical requirements. We've got to eat every day. We've got, to, we've got to come somewhere and have church service. But God forbid that we should ever look at this like, boy, this is it. Building the kingdom for God. I'm not building no kingdom. Try to get people into, into the kingdom of God where the Holy Ghost is in them and they're in the Holy Ghost or they're in Christ. And then get out of here. Paul never set up a church-state religion. Paul never joined a government, a government-controlled church. Paul never connects the church to any form of government. 
you'll find that's so completely absent that you're actually questioning yourself like, what? Because wherever you happen to be, guess what? You've got the same Bible. And the same goals. That's the reason why it's different. And that's why your worldview will change after you get saved. You will never look at this world the same again one time through your Bible. You'll notice that Paul never employs the physical trappings of religion. You know, candles and beads and prayer wheels and holy water and holy places and holy johns, holy garments. You'll notice it's void of that because it's not about that. It's not about that. It's about something in here. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So we don't get caught up in that physical stuff. And not supposed to. So Paul's given special revelations from God for this age. And that's where 2 Corinthians 12, 7, I knew I was going to get around to it, and I'm almost done. It says um, in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of of the revelations that were given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Man, Paul is given the whole enchilada for the next 2,000 years. It's given to him to give to us. A dispensing, of, the dispensation of the grace of God, a dispensing of grace given to Paul, given to us. God trusted him with it. In fact, it was so momentous in Revelation, that he has to give him a thorn in the flesh to keep him from getting overly proud. You realize, you realize he's getting revelation that nobody had gotten. Probably the one, the only one that is even close to that is who? Huh? Moses. Where did Moses get his revelation? You know where Paul talks about going into the Arabian desert? Oh, that's what I'm thinking. Gets it at the same place. I mean, man, it's, he says his revelation is not, not, from, uh, not from men. He got it from God himself. Well, where'd he get it? Well, he goes out into that Arabian desert where that Sinai mountain is. He gets that revelation somewhere. I mean, you know, he, he say he's even got to c convince the apostles of the Lamb who really now have a gospel that is like no longer in vogue. <laughs> Why? Because God is shifting. He's moving away from Judea, Jerusalem. He's moving even away from Samaria where you got Jew and Gentile mix there. He's moving to the uttermost parts of the earth. Everything's moving away. Why? Because God's putting that aside, man. He's putting them, put that kingdom aside. Put that, uh, that Daniel's 70th week aside. What? Turn to the Gentiles. That's what Romans 11 tells you. Romans 11. It tells you the mercy. Okay. Quickly. And this is what Dr. Ruckman gives. I thought this was as good as any about the divisions of the chapters or divisions of the book. Uh, chapters 1 to 5 are historical chapters. Some good information there, and it helps to understand when you, when you realize it's historical. Uh, chapters 6 through 8 are doctrinal chapters. Chapters 9 through 11 are prophetical chapters. Chapters 12 through 14 are practical chapters. And chapter 15 and 16 is the conclusion of the book. So next week we'll get into... Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Okay. Any questions about what we covered tonight? It's not that exciting going through the...